this me or not? So there are a lot of cameras. Every you move. Okay, we'll be recorded. Okay. So you need to be careful when I scratch and I move. And... Okay. okay, great. So uh, I would really like to thank the organizers. I myself organized uh, two summer schools in the past. I, I know it's a lot of work to make things smooth and to keep you all happy. So uh, I really want to thank them for, for this huge effort of, of setting up this and for inviting me, of course. Uh, and so um, I will be talking today about computational optimal transport. This afternoon, we will have uh, two practical sessions with my student, uh, PhD student, François-Pierre Paty, who is now in the back of the room that you will see uh, later this afternoon. And uh, so just to introduce myself, I am a research scientist at Google Brain in Paris. Uh, and uh, I am also a professor at uh, NSA, a uh, school in, uh, in, uh, in, in the south of Paris. So, just to start, let me just see if this works. Can I get this to work? Maybe yes. Yes. So, just a few slides. Why should you even care about optimal transport? So, it's, uh, it's one of those fields right now which seems to be quite popular in, in different uh, areas. And uh, here I've uh, just, just, I see some echo maybe, it's okay. It okay? Yeah. So, so it's one of those fields that's uh, slowly taking its, uh, I mean, becoming popular in different areas. So one of them is economics, and it's arguably maybe the first one where those ideas were developed. Then applied math, pure math, and recently we, we uh, released a book with uh, my colleague Gabriel Perrin, uh, talking more about computations and if you look at uh, some applications there are a lot of applications which are traditionally associated with transport one of them is graphics and Michael and Justin will be talking a bit about this uh, later in the summer school but there's one which is I think I'm sorry I'm listening to a lot of Larsen is this fine okay is there anything I should do Okay, I have to stay in the middle. Okay. <laughs> okay, far from the speakers. Okay. So uh, there's one field which seems to be. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not working the way it's intended to work. No. Uh, it doesn't want to. Okay maybe, yeah, okay, maybe I need to be very close. Okay, so this is where I need to be. <laughs> okay. So there's one, there's one recent application that I'm very excited about. I, I, I'm especially excited about because I haven't done it. It's someone else. And it's in biology. So you can... Uh, so if you're close, it works. But if you're a bit far... Yeah, but here, yeah, but here it doesn't. No. <laughs> uh, <right>. Here. <laughs> Here it works. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <I've seen that. laughs> okay. Maybe we'll replace the battery for <laughs> during the break. So, as I was saying, there's one application which is uh, exciting, which is uh, which is a very recent paper in Cell Journal, where there is a biology paper that whose title starts with "Optimal transport reconstructs something." So, for a mathematician, it's very exciting when your tool is somewhat proved or shown to be useful in a very very and another deep part of, of science. So the other reason why I think it's a, a nice area to work in is that it has a bit of everything. If you like maths and computations and statistics and probability and PDEs and whatever, it, it's a field that has been built on the, on, on the success over the last centuries of several people. And here is a picture of a few of them. So the, the, the field is usually attributed to Monge who uh, started this in, in 1781. And then there was a wave of works by uh, notably very famous mathematician from Russia, uh, Kantorovich, uh, and uh, Kupmans, uh, an economist from the US who got a Nobel Prize for, for their work in this field. Danzig is the father of linear programming in the sense of, uh, of div he devised the network simplex. And then for a few years, there was not much going on in optimal transport until mathematicians actually from, uh, from the PD world uh, captured uh, th this problem and, and provided a, a neat and very nice formulation to study it. So all of those works basically are, are important when we do optimal transport, and especially when we do optimal transport in an applied world. And this is what we'll be talking about. It's very exciting to see that for 
if you want to find inspiration to come up with new tools for data using optimal transport, you can look at maths. And uh, there are very nice insights from maths. On the other hand, mathematicians live in this ideal world where everything is continuous and everything is more or less well behaved and they can impose conditions on this and that and the function must be this and that. We, when we use this in data sciences, we have to cope with data. We have to deal with data. So this requires a lot of adaptation and this will be the, the, the main subject of my talk. So another reason, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a fairly trending subject. So I was doing this uh, yesterday night, looking at uh, the frequency of web searches on Wasserstein. So Wasserstein is one of those keywords that appear very often in the optimal transport literature. It stands for the distance that people use in optimal transport. And as you can see, this is, I think, uh, last 10 years, maybe? Yes, it's last 10 years. So Wasserstein is slowing peaky up. Of course, everything is, is somewhat related. If you compare it to deep learning, uh, you can't really claim a trend there, right? At least, at least we're not peaking. That's the, that is the thing. So this is, you can see that deep learning is somewhat, has somewhat peaked. And so Wasserstein is still growing, and I hope this lecture will contribute to this growth. So uh, to keep you know, being quite informal describing this, this field, let's see that the optimal transport theory provides a very natural geometry to compare probability measures. It can be generalized to other things, but the main focus, initial focus of optimal transport theory is to say we have two probability distributions. How can we compare them? How can we go from one probability distribution to the other? What is the nice way to change a probability distribution so that it fits another probability distribution? So if this sounds very abstract, well, we can take a step back and think that a lot of what we do in statistics is essentially manipulating probability distributions, fitting a, a, a model to a data measure. In a lot of applied uh, uh, fields, we like to represent very complicated things as probability distributions of smaller things. So this is the so-called bag of features uh, representation. And we see it a lot in, uh, in natural language processing. When you, do, when you take empirical measurements, when you, when you measure things in reality, very often you never, are never able to really pinpoint where something happened, but more so you are more or less sure that something happened in some area. So here in this case, in the brain imaging, you would get data that would tell you when someone looked at a face, this is the area in the cortex that was lit up. And maybe for the same stimulus, you would have someone else's cortex that would be lit up in a different area. So we would like to compare those two distributions. There is also a very big literature on generative models going on in, 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 uh, in machine learning today. And you can also cast the generation of data and the way you fit generative models to data as, as, a, as a problem where you compare probability distributions. And the, the very last example that I'm showing the lower right is, is a very intuitive example of probability distributions that we see when we take pictures with our camera. We can instantly look at the distribution of colors of, of, our, of, our, uh, of our image. So in all of these cases that I've described, we're essentially given the task that you want to compare probability distributions. And one thing that optimal transport will be useful for is that it will be useful to pro compare two probability distributions which are supported on a space which is geometric. So by this I mean that you have on the one hand a distribution and it's made of, let's say, physical locations in the cortex, words, whatever, colors, and you have another distribution. And what is really, really important in optimal transport is that you are able to compare those two small things. So transport is useful if you want. Imagine you have a space of observations, so let's say words. If you define a geometry on words, then you can instantly define a geometry on probability distributions of words. So if you can, for instance, measure the distance between two colors, what optimal transport and the optimal transport, transport bo toolbox sorry, provides instantly is a way to compare those two distributions of colors. So this, this is a tool, if you want, it's a meta tool in the sense that it, it generalizes the base geometry to the geometry of distributions. Of course, one of the issues that we have in machine learning, especially in high dimensional applications of machine learning, is that we're never really sure what is the good geometry that, to compare 
points in, low di in high dimensions. So this is one of the issues that we have to, with transport. We have to be careful a bit about how we define the distances at the base level so that we get something that's meaningful at the higher level. But still, in, in all of those applications that I'm showing, basically transport has provided very nice uh, tools. Oh, sorry. So this was just... So the today's, today's uh, and tomorrow's uh, lectures will basically focus on a few things. I will first start with an introduction to optimal transport. I will describe how we can compute optimal transport exactly. And I will show that this is not necessarily the best way to do so. So what I mean by computing the optimal transport exactly is basically following the principles set out by Kantorovich in the, in the 40s and Danzig basically using linear programming. And I will tell you that this is maybe not the best way to do it. And this is why I have a slightly different chapter, which is computing, computing optimal transport for data sciences. And then I will close with selected applications. So I, since I only have 10 minutes left, I think I will just start with uh, a, a, a small introduction to optimal transport, some a bit of a cartoon, explaining the two traditional formulations of optimal transport, because there's two of them. One is by Morge and one is by Kantorovich. And I will then uh, follow and explain why, why this optimal transport geometry is, is meaningful. So let me just zoom to Gaspard Monge. So Gaspard Monge was a French mathematician, 1746-1818. So uh, if you think about it as a scientist, a notable uh, fact of Gaspard Monge is that he survived the French Revolution. So roughly when he was 30-40, let's say 40, uh, it was a good age to be killed, you know, if you were a scientist in the French Revolution. And so he, actually, quite the opposite, he managed to get a lot of support from the state and Napoleon to uh, build a lot of very important institutions in, in France, scientific institutions in France. And if you travel to Paris ever, you will, you will see signs of this everywhere. So Monge's name pops up very often in, 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 in some areas in Paris, especially in the fifth arrondissement, it's, a, it's an area in, in central Paris, and there's in particular uh, a metro station called Place Monge, which is uh, somewhere in Rue Monge, and there's lots of uh, Monge named things around, and uh, if you look at it, it's even an attraction on TripAdvisor, I was happy to find that, and so there's a market called Market Monge, etc., etc. So if you ever come to Paris, please pay tribute to Monge and go there. So. So Morge uh, published a work in 1781 called La Mémoire sur la théorie des déblés et des remblés. So if you don't speak French, let me just translate a bit what this, uh, what this means. Basically, Morge asked himself the problem of how to be an efficient builder, basically. How to build things efficiently. And at that time, that meant essentially how to take sand or earth or whatever or stones from one place and put them in the configuration that you need, for instance, to build a wall or something, and to do this in an effective way, efficient way. So let me just uh, do a cartoon. Imagine that you have some sand that's standing somewhere, you know, a pile of sand. It's been given to you by nature this way. And you want to move it somewhere for a purpose. So here, Let's suppose that we have a hole in the ground and you need to fill it up, okay? And we will assume that the volume of the pile of sand is exactly the same as the volume of the hole. And so Monge asks, what is the efficient way to do this? How can I fill up this hole? So if I make, a, if you allow this little joke, in the 21st century, if you ask anyone how you should do that, well, there's not, not many questions that you should ask. Just take a powerful machine and just bring up all the sand, push it, push it without thinking about optimality or anything, and the work is done in a matter of minutes. Now, if you think about it in the 18th century, people were a bit more careful, and the likely way to do this was basically to come up with a shovel, take the mass at some point x, and so we're going to use a, a density notation here, so remember, my density of sand is this, is this small pile. And if I go to a point x, I will lift 
some amount of sand or, or matter, which will be proportional to mu of x, the density of that, uh, that measure at that point x. And what the worker will do, the worker will follow my orders, and the worker will bring that sand exactly at where I tell the worker to bring it, which I will write y, which is t of x. Okay? And so the worker brings the sand from y to t of x, and starts filling up infinitesimally, if you want, small, very, very small amounts, this, this hole. And uh, what the worker had to do was to walk from x to t of x, that's a certain distance. And what Morse said, and it's a reasonable assumption, he said, well, I can characterize the work involved there as the product of the density times the distance. In short, it's basically the mass times how much you have to walk. So if you have to bring two kilos, it's twice more expensive than bringing one kilo, let's say. And uh, what you have to think is, this map that I'm going to give the worker, so it's a mathematical map, in the sense that it, it tells the worker how much, where, where I, the mass at each x should be sent at, at each, uh, well, should be sent in the second measure. Well. This map must be such that in the end, when the worker has finished his work, basically have filled up the hole. That's the most important thing for me. And so you can write this in term mathematically by saying that if you look at a special portion B of the landing area, well, there will be some mass, some sand that will be coming into that segment from the original measure. And I will call this t minus 1 of b. If I define a function t, then there should be some x's which have been sent to b. Okay? So there must be some x such that t of x belongs to this segment. And if you think about it, maybe those x's might come from different areas of the original measure. They don't need to be coming only from one segment area of, of the input measure. And so the natural constraint that you have if you think about it, is that the mass that I need to fill up the hole with is equal to the mass that I'm taking from the red measure. Okay? So if you want mathematically, you, should, you would write it as simply saying that the measure of each of those segments summed up is equal to the measure of the target measure of uh, this segment B. Okay? U of A1 plus mu of A2 plus mu of A3, what I have colored in, 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 in pink, in purple, should be equal to this, uh, the total volume that is, that is in, the, in the light blue area. So here I've just defined, selected one particular segment arbitrarily. What you want is that this, is, this works for every segment B. Okay? So if I just move B anywhere where the second measure is supported, I should be able to find that my map T has brought me sufficient sand. So mathematically, we write this as the measure of the inverse map of B is equal to the new measure of B, new, new of B. I hope I haven't uh, gone too fast into the math here, but this is basically called a push-forward constraint. It's essentially that if I were to take each sand at x by moving it at t of x, on aggregate, my goal is that I reconstruct exactly the target measure. And this is a very important concept in, in optimal transport theory. We will start from a given probability distribution, and we want to land to a different probability distribution. Now, what Moore's insight was, because this is not so much of a, I mean, mathematically, it's just a change of variable formula. What, what is really nice about the insight of Moore is that he asked the following question. He said, there's many ways that I can use a map T to go from u to a different measure nu. There's, there's usually many ways you can come up with. Now, which one is the most effective? And by most effective, Morse posed the equation. He said, I will minimize the integral of all those displacements times the mass. So this is the work. So I will minimize the integral of the work uh, once I have finished entirely my, my, my work, okay? my, my, my displacement. And so Morge asked this, this problem, and this is what we know now as the optimal transport problem, and which has, was kept in the drawers for about 100, 120, 30, 40 years, 
and which reappeared in the 20th century in Russia uh, by, uh, following work by Tolstoy. So I will, I will uh, start with that uh, late, uh, next. Maybe. Um, I have to get this right. I feel like we should almost do a team here, a team there, and make some kind of game or something like that. <laughs> Feels like very balanced. So, uh, so I will just finish basically explaining about this idea that uh, Monge proposed uh, the problem, framed the problem. Of course, he was not able to solve it mathematically at that time. And actually, we still have a bit of a hard time to solve the problem exactly the way he posed it. So it's not so easy to do this integration where you minimize over the set of all maps that push forward uh, mu to nu, and, uh, and especially with this, with, this, with this distance. I will show later and explain later that there was a major breakthrough that happened two centuries later when you uh, define the cost to move things as a squared distance as not, and not as a distance. Now, the other big figure in optimal transport is Kantorovich. So it's a subject of historical debate, you know, as we often have in mathematics, who we should attribute the idea to. So there's one person that is actually famous in the community, or I mean, somewhat a bit famous for having started this as well, is Tolstoy. So Tolstoy was a Russian mathematician in the 30s who developed an optimization of transportation on the rail network of uh, the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, I was never able to find a picture of Tolstoy. So if anyone here is a history buff and likes to uh, scrap websites looking for pictures of lost mathematicians, please send me the picture of Tolstoy. You will definitely improve this slide. So uh, the, the person who is most famous for, for this work is, is Kantorovich, of course, who uh, in the late 30s, uh, published this work on the methods of production, and I'm sorry, I don't read the Syriac alphabet yet, but I remember there's, there's a, so it's mathematical methods about production and something else, and those were basically the main ideas that were set up, and it's very interesting to see that right at the same time, in the United States, another mathematician called Hitchcock uh, proposed a very similar formulation. He didn't go as far as Kantorovich for reasons that we'll detail later, later essentially duality, but the idea was, was the same. And so he, what is, I think, important to figure out is that you have to picture, you know, the world is at war. There is clearly a big pressure on all of the economies in the world to organize, planify, and deliver in an optimal way. So it's not a free market economy at all, you know, when you're at war. It's a completely directed, directed economy. And there, both in both, in, in both countries, there is this problem of how to translocate resources from where they are to where we want them to be. And those resources might be anything. They might be factories, they might be mines, etc., uh, or land or earth, as I uh, said with Monge. But in, the, in the World War II, one of the examples that we use very often to illustrate optimal transport is basically soldiers. So you have a front line. So here you have a, the, the front line between the Nazis and the, and the Red Army. And this is the Battle of Stalingrad, I think, in the 40s. And you can imagine that there is one area where the Red Army needs a lot of soldiers. So this is a big star on the lower left with 120. So let's say this is 120,000 soldiers are needed there. 90,000 soldiers are needed somewhere in the middle. And neither 90,000 soldiers are, are needed in the bottom. And there are some barracks around this front line. And the barracks each, each holds a certain number of soldiers, and for the purpose of this example, they balance. So the same amount of soldiers uh, uh, is available in the barracks that we need in the front line. Now the problem that we ask is, or Kantorovich asks, is what is the optimal way to bring the soldiers from this configuration where they are in the barracks to the, to the stars? So the French version of this is basically one with uh, restaurants and baguettes. And so you have restaurants which are somewhere in Paris. They need 120 baguettes, 90 and 90. And there are bakeries that, need the, that produce the same amount of, of, uh, of uh, baguettes. And they send the, the, you need to figure out what is the optimal way. And actually this example is taken verbatim from uh, Cédric Vinani's uh, textbook. So let's switch back to the soldiers one. Uh, it makes for more drama. So we have those, those, uh, those soldiers there. And Essentially, what is a good way, what, what can you think of as, as, as a good way to transport those soldiers? 
So there's one way that you should all think about uh, to do this task. There's one very naive solution that you should come to mind. You shouldn't think too much about it. Anyone has an idea? You have some quantity that you need in some configuration and you have it in another configuration. Is there any hack? Any simple? Sorry? Keep proportions. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Exactly. So the idea is that on, the, on both sides, basically, you can see this mathematically as two histograms. They all sum up to 300. They all have different proportions. Of course, if it was, for instance, 100, 100, 100, then one easy way would be to match entirely one barrack with one front line, etc. But here we have some, some mixture. And so what you could do is just simply look at the proportions of the barracks. And the proportion of the barracks, sorry, the, the front line is basically 120, 90, and 90. So it's four to three to three. For every four soldiers you want in the left, you will need three in the middle and three in the bottom, okay? And so what the generals could agree on all together is let's say, let's find a splitting rule. I will take my soldiers, split them according to proportions four, three, three. So if you had 60 in the first barrack on the top, that would be 24, 18, and 18. If you had 90 on the top right, that would be 20, 36, 27, 27, and 45, 45, 60 for the, for, the, for the bottom part. And now, now that the generals have just simply said, we're going to make this split and send our soldiers, you will start seeing some movements, of course, some movements of troops. And of course, because everything was done in a proportional way, some of the soldiers will move a long, long way, right? Typically, the ones that were on the top left have to travel all the way down to the bottom right. And that makes a lot of movement. And this is the cost. You, here you find again the idea of the cost that Morge was trying to minimize. Okay? So the naive approach results in many displacements. The idea of Kantorovich as Morge is can we find a cheaper alternative? But here, just to start setting up ideas, the big difference between Morge and Kantorovich is you remember I told you that the worker in the Morge example was taking all of the sand from one point X and bringing it to one point Y. Basically, there was a one-to-one -one mapping, okay, from one one location to another. Here in the Kantorovich setup, I am allowed to do what people call mass splitting. You know, I, I'm splitting, I'm, I'm allowed to split my soldiers, let's say if I have 60,000 soldiers into 30 and 30,000, 20, 40,000, etc. And this is the big difference conceptually between Monge and Kantorovich. So let's take a step back and think about the problem itself. What does define the problem? Well, the problem is first defined by what we will call marginals. So those are basically the quantities of those two histograms. So it's 60, 90, 150 on the one hand, 120, 90, and 90 on the other hand. And then there is a network which we will summarize as just a matrix of distances. We call it a matrix of pairwise distances. It's all the distance from each barrack that, that is there to each front line that you want to bring the soldiers to. And so with, the, with these two things, you have already summarized the problem. And then, what you want to find out, the answer, the, the question that, 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 that Kantorovich asks is, how much from each barrack will I send to each front line? And this you can summarize in a matrix. And we call this usually a transportation matrix or a coupling, in a, in, if you use probabilistic words. It's essentially, if you give me two histograms, two marginals, I want to find a matrix that will have some properties such that it describes such a transportation. So let me be a bit more precise. If you think about the transportation matrix, it's essentially a collection of numbers which tell you from which barrack, how much soldiers, how many soldiers you take from each barrack, and how many you bring to each, to each front line. So if we think of it in more abstract terms, mathematical terms, I would say that this is, on the one hand, there is a probability distribution described by indices, by, by values A1, A2, A3. And then another probability distribution described by uh, in, uh, indices, uh, values, sorry, B, 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 A, B, 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 C. And the distance matrix will be indexed in the same way. So what is the natural constraint 
that you have on this transportation matrix. Well, we call this a conservation of mass constraint. It's a very intuitive constraint that if you look at all of the soldiers on this first line, if you look at the first line of this matrix, it's P1A, P1B, P1C. It tells you how many soldiers you are sending from 1 to A, 1 to B, and 1 to C. So, of course, the sum of those numbers must be equal to the number of soldiers that were available in the barrack to start with. Okay? And so on with the second line, and so on with the third line. And now we have a column constraint, which is that if you look at this first column on the left, we have P1A, P2A, P3A, and that is basically listing how many soldiers are sent from the first barrack to A, the second barrack to A, the third barrack to A. And the sum of those numbers must sum the amount of soldiers that we need to receive in this particular uh, frontline position. So those are called conservation of mass constraints, and they're very important. And then, of course, there's one very simple constraint that you can think of, which is that all of the elements of this matrix P, of the transportation matrix P, must be non-negative. We cannot borrow soldiers from one barrack that do not exist. Okay? So that's for the constraints. Now think about how to define the cost function. What is the problem Kantorovich wants to optimize? Well, it's a very natural uh, generalization, if you want, of what Morse proposed. He said, if there are soldiers that are traveling in certain numbers from one barrack to one front line, then let the cost of that transportation be how many soldiers times how many kilometers. Okay? And you sum that over the entire transportation matrix and you get the cost that people solve when they solve the optimal transport problem. Okay? Are there any questions? By, by the way, I, I didn't say this in earlier because it's, uh, it's obvious to me, but it may not be obvious with such a big room. If you have any question, please feel free to interrupt anytime. I'm usually super happy to take questions because that kind of slows down the pace or allows me to elaborate on something that I didn't explain well enough. So please feel free to raise your hand and sometimes maybe <laughs> shout out <laughs> if I don't see you. <laughs> um, so in this particular example, what you would recover, I haven't explained how to optimize this yet. I'm just doing the modelization here. If you were to optimize, typically this is what an optimal transport solver would return. It would basically say the first barrack splits itself into two, the second barrack just will send integrally one its mass to some, some post, and then we will split this third one into two as well. And then you have this displacement, which you see are uh, uh, effectively a lot less costly. So, if you want to have a bit of a philosophical discussion here on the strengths and the weaknesses of optimal transport the way they are defined, um, imagine you're the Nazis here for a minute. And imagine you want to counterattack, okay? And you want to inflict uh, casualties. And you think, oh, those Russians, they're very good at mathematics, though they must have computed the optimal transport, right? There must be a way they are doing this in a carefully executed way. If I were such a general, I would very easily think about a way to bother the Russians, which would be to bomb one of the particular roads where there's the most traffic, right? So if you think about this one where I just showed you, the one where the 90s from the top left go to the lower right, left, the top right go to the lower left, would be a big pain, right? Because all of a sudden, I don't have enough, uh, enough soldiers on the lower left. On the other hand, if you think about the proportional way to do things, the one where I split things completely evenly, without looking even at the topology of the, the network, this is the most unpredictable, if you want. So what is the, less, the least inform, uh, informed decision, and therefore, it's the most robust, right? So two ways, two philosophies to do the same thing. One is extremely optimized. It's doing the very best you can do. But as a consequence, if you were to change a bit the rules of the game, if you were to tweak the distances, then maybe this would not be at all a good solution. On the other hand, you have this solution which doesn't even look at the cost, pops up a way to do things. 
And that, the good thing is, when you're blind, basically, to these kind of things, well, even if you were to change some of the, some of the distances, then your solution would more or less uh, stay the same, and everything is stable from a statistical point of view. So this, this very simple observation is something that I will elaborate later on, when I will, when I will introduce some, some other ways to compute optimal transport. Now, uh, in, in a, so those were like cartoon explanations of optimal transport. So on the one hand, we have this Morse problem, which is described usually using, using continuous distributions. And we have the Kantorovich problem, which is described using you know, points where there are masses and things move around. And you can number, basically, where you have resources and number where you need them. Uh, this translates informally, mathematically, into the Morse problem is somewhat something that people like in maths and PDEs. And uh, it's, it's what mostly pure mathematicians are working on. And the bottom part, Kantorovich formulation, is more what people in applied sciences play with. Because data, when you're given data, it's always under the form of something that looks like the bottom. It's basically points that are weighted in space. Whereas when you play with maths, it's more like a continuous function that we can assume some properties, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why very often, when you talk about Morse, it would be for theoretical purposes. When you talk about Kantorovich, it's more applied. Now, the boundaries of those things are a bit blurred recently. I mean, there's more, more and more applications of uh, the Morse formulation to, optimal, to machine learning. But essentially, the divide is there. So let me be a bit more precise mathematically now. So we're not going to just move sand on a line. We're going to imagine that we have a space, which we call omega. We have probability distributions defined on that space. And we have a cost. So the cost can be anything, actually. It doesn't need to be a distance. It's just the cost of moving mass from one point to another. So the Morse problem was find the map from omega to omega, something that moves things around in the space omega, <coughs> such that the push forward of the measure mu under this map t is equal to nu, and such that this, the t that we want to find minimizes this, this cost. Okay? I hope this, this, uh, this integral translates into something intuitive for you. We're just trying to find ways to morph, change this measure mu so that we are guaranteed that it becomes the measure that we want, which is new, the second measure. But we want to do this morphing or transformation in an optimal way. So, as I told you earlier, <coughs> surprisingly, we had to wait two centuries to get a nice result on this problem. And uh, so the first is 1781, and Brunier is 1987. Okay. And Brunier's theorem which to me still comes as a surprise. It's such a beautiful result in math that I would like to share it with you. It's increasingly playing a role in, in data sciences. Uh, it's the following. It says something very, very deep. So if the space is RD, okay, something that we're all comfortable with, if the data is living in the Euclidean space, if the cost is the qu squared Euclidean distance, again, that's something that we're very comfortable with. We always play with the squared Euclidean distance to, to measure discrepancy. If the measures are continuous, that, that can be relaxed a bit, but let's say they are continuous for the sake of simplicity, then the optimal transport, the one that is the best optimal transport, is necessarily the gradient of a convex function. So think about it. A convex function is a function that is from Rd to R. It is value in the real numbers. Okay. The gradient of u, you can see it as a map from Rd to Rd. Okay, it's something that to any x, any input associates, any vector input associates a vector output. So you can consider the push forward of a measure under a gradient, the gradient of any, any function, and in particular a convex function. Well, it turns out that in the, op the world of optimal transport, if you want to transport things optimally, you have to use convexity. And actually, it's a bit deeper than that. It says the following thing. If you take any convex function and any measure, if you push forward the measure mu by the gradient of a convex function, 
then this is necessarily the, the optimal transfer map. So in, uh, in loose words, if you want to move from one measure to another measure in an optimal way, optimal transfer way, you should always follow the gradient of a convex function. Any, any convex function is fine, but you should always follow it. So I will not use too much these results in these lectures. It's popping up in recent submissions in, in NeurIPS, ICML, etc. Uh, but let's say it's more a field in progress to use that, those tools in, in machine learning right now. It's, it's mostly considered by, by people in maths. But I just wanted to point out this very, very interesting connection between optimal transport and convexity. Now, the reason why this Morse formulation is not still yet so common in stats is because if you think about it, there is something really a bit flawed about this Morse formulation when you use it on data. So what is the difference between data and a continuous, absolutely continuous measure? Where data is basically, in, in, in probabilistic definitions, it's essentially a Dirac measure, or a discrete measure. It's a bunch of you know, wells or peaks like this with no uncertainty. It's just a few points. And if you think about formulating optimal transport as more when the data is a peak, then it doesn't work. So imagine, imagine the following. Imagine that I have an infinite supply of sand, that's a Dirac mass at this point, and I need to fill up a hole somewhere in that area. And imagine I follow the formalism of Morge. What Morge would tell me, if I pick up this shovel, I pick up this infinite amount of concentrated, infinitely concentrated amount of sand here, and I bring it somewhere, and there's no way I can actually fill up an entire area, an entire hole there. That doesn't work. I need to split, if you want, the mass that is in this Dirac mass, so that I can spread it out. And that's, that's the, 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 if you want, the main insight from Kantorovich theory. The way I presented Kantorovich was very intuitive because it involves locations in space that were concentrated with those barracks, etc. But you can see it in mass, basically. It pops up there. And the idea of Kantorovich is essentially when you do optimal transport and move stuff, you should be allowed the freedom to take stuff, split it out, and spread it out the way you want. And so in mathematical terms, what it means is that instead of looking for a deterministic map T that takes a point X and bring it, brings it to some point Y is equal to T of X, I will allow myself to define, yes? So you mean, if you have, w w does the Morse map always exist? This is your question. It, so there are some, actually, hypotheses that you can make on the cost and that you can make on the shape or the nature of those densities. So they shouldn't put mass on small sets. So uh, there are a few technical assumptions that you can put on the densities that guarantee the existence of a Morse map. But if you make no assumptions, they don't, a Morse map does not exist. So thinking even about the case where you have one Dirac here, and I'm trying to push forward this Dirac to two Dirac's. There's no way, right? Because whenever I push forward one Dirac, I get one Dirac. I cannot split it into two. If you're not giving me the possibility to split it, then I, can, I cannot recover something that's more spread out than what I have initially. Okay. So there are some hypotheses, but uh, for the sake, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about them, but this is typically what, what, what people in math have been working a lot uh, about in, let's say, in the last 30 years, or in the 80s and the 90s. So, if you think about this, uh, this generalization, it's essentially that you will allow yourself now to consider probabilistic maps, and this is what we call couplings. A coupling is something that associates a probability to two points, x and y. And so you can derive from a coupling this conditional uh, distribution that I just described here. So this was the conditional distribution of this coupling. So it's probability of the random variable y given that I'm starting from small x. Okay. 
So I'm spreading the mass all, all around there. And a coupling is essentially the following. It's just a joint probability distribution. Okay, so if you are comparing measure in omega and another in omega, it's just a probability distribution on omega times omega, such that if I push all of the mass in either direction, I recover one of the two marginals. Okay, that's the natural constraint that I have to comply with. And you remember it from this Cantorovich formulation. I was giving you the Cantorovich formulation in a discrete case. Here I'm giving it in the, in the continuous case. It's essentially, when I look at how the mass moves around between one in, uh, starting point to an uh, ending point, I need to recover the marginals. Okay, what, 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 I, what I'm pulling basically is must sum up to the marginals. What I'm pushing must sum up to the, the margin of the, of, the, of the target. So here you have one example. So good news is no matter which marginals you give me, there is always a coupling that satisfies marginal constraints. Which one is it? Any idea? Where is the coupling that you, if you give me a measure mu and another measure nu, I can always come up with a measure p which satisfies the constraints that I've written there. The product, the product of the two marginals. So if you, if you say p x y is equal to density, let's say, let's say everything has a density, density of x at x y of p is equal to mu of x times nu of y, then you get a coupling. So unlike the Morse case where there is not always a map that exists, a push-forward map that exists, here in the coupling case, there is always something that can basically relate one measure to another. And to illustrate my point here, I have uh, two mixtures of Gaussians, uh, and if you play a bit with them, you can easily f come up with a different coupling. Okay? Now, Morse formulation is above, the Kantorovich formulation is, the, is, is in the bottom. It's basically the double integral, so I'm, I'm integrating over this entire coupling of the cost. But here you should not see anything more complicated except for the double sum, uh, the integral uh, operation, than what I was describing here. Here I was basically saying I have a sum of P, I, J, D, I, J, okay, the, the amount of soldiers that go from I to J multiplied by the distance between I and J. This is exactly the same thing as this definition where I'm taking the integral with respect to this coupling P of the cost and then I'm trying to think what is the best possible coupling. Okay? So this is a continuous infinite dimensional linear program but it's, it's, it's nothing else than, than what I, I showed you earlier. <laughs> now I said that Hitchcock and other people actually worked on this, uh, on this problem roughly at the same time. One of the reasons why Kantorovich is actually famous and more famous than the other ones is because he studied duality. He was one of the first people to notice that for this, optimal, uh, for this optimization problem, which is defined above, there exists another equivalent dual uh, optimization problem. So if you, if you know about duality, this will not come as a surprise, of course, because this is a linear program, we are, integrate, we, we are summing up things with linear constraints, so it's natural that the, the, this, this optimization problem has a dual. But if you are not familiar with this, let me just walk you through duality and explain roughly how we get there. So the dual problem is the following. It says, I will consider now functions that people call test functions in maths that you can integrate against mu and nu. So it's any function, real valued function, that goes from omega to r, and I'm going to take the integral of phi against mu plus the integral of psi against nu, and take the supremum of that. However, there is a catch. Those functions need to agree on something, which is that for every x and y, phi of x plus psi of y must be smaller than the cost to go between x and y. So at first sight, it doesn't seem that these two programs are related. The infimum over couplings of the cost of the coupling and this quite artificial program here. But actually they're the same in the sense that they lead to the same value. So, so let me just uh, try to walk you through this. So I will use one notation which is a bit, uh, which is uh, space efficient. And I'm going to say that uh, if I have a function phi and a function psi, each of one parameter, 
Then I write phi plus this round plus psi of x y to be the function basically to two that two for two variables x y associates phi of x plus psi of y. Okay, so it's some kind of tensor addition. Okay? I'm just I'm just summing up two additions on different on different values. So this in this way I can do this uh, slightly sm shorter notation phi of x plus psi of y is smaller than c of x y is the same thing as writing that psi plus round uh, psi if I plus round psi is smaller than the function c so let me just start and ask a question that you can try to solve imagine that I have two functions phi plus and psi they're whatever uh, and I integrate them against mu the first one and I integrate the second one against new okay the red with the red the blue with the blue and then I take a coupling that has the right margins it has it's a coupling P that has marginal mu and u and I ask yourself what is the, what is what is this sum integral of phi d mu plus integral of psi d nu minus the double integral of phi of x plus psi of y dp x y anyone has an idea If you have a co yeah, this is typically the kind of thing when you look at covariances because it's a coupling, right? So you're going to look at two things that move together. But here there's one thing that's interesting, which is you're integrating against a coupling. But if you look at it, this function phi plus psi, okay, maybe maybe it's not such a good uh, notation after all. Remember, it's phi of x plus psi of y. So I can split this into two things. On the one hand, I will sum up my coupling P against phi of x. And I will sum up my coupling, my function psi against uh, d, dpxy. So here, the double integrals basically have no meaning in the sense that what I'm integrating here against is a function that only depends on uh, on x, and this one only depends on y. So here, I don't really care that there's a y here because it will sum up to one, and here I don't really care there's an x here because it will sum up to uh, one as well. So now, if I get this. If P is a coupling and it has the right marginals, what do you get? Essentially, you get what you had on the left-hand side, right? Think about it mathematically. This is a coupling which has marginal mu and uh, marginal nu on the right-hand side. If here I'm integrating it, even if I integrate against Y, it doesn't have any effect. I mean, it, it normalizes to one for each value of x, and so here I will I will I will be able to to cancel out these two terms. So in short, if p has these right marginals, then those two things kind of cancel out. They're equal to zero. Now, what if I don't assume that p has this nice property? I just assume it's a positive measure. I don't even need to assume that it's a probability measure. It's anything that has a positive mass uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the product space of uh, omega times omega. Well, I'm not saying something very clever here. I'm just saying that this will somewhat be decomposed as the integral of phi against mu minus the first marginal of p plus the integral of psi times nu minus the second marginal of p. Okay, by following the same logic. So somewhat, some things here will be left out and will not be zero. Okay? There will be some mass that will be left out there. So this leads me to the following point, and this is the, the, the fundamental point in duality, which is that, think about this function. I'm going to say that this, this is what people call usually the indicator function of pi. Uh, you give me a p, okay, a, a coupling p, and I will compute the supremum, the sup, meaning I will take the worst possible functions that maximizes as much as I can the quantity on the right hand side. Okay, so what are the unknowns? It's phi m psi, right? I have selected a p and I'm choosing phi m psi. So I just told you that if p 
has marginals mu and u, then this must be zero, right? This, this quantity on the top right hand is zero. So even if I choose the worst possible phi m psi, I don't have much <coughs> effect on what's going on. It's always going to be zero. On the other hand, if p doesn't have the right marginals, then you remember, I'm integrating it against two measures which are not zero. So I, if I can choose phi m psi freely, well, anywhere where this first measure of mu minus px is positive, I can put a very large value on phi. Anywhere where, where it's negative, I can put a very large negative value. And so we can, I can very easily construct something that diverges to plus infinity. Okay? So this is a, a, an important way to define what people call an indicator function. It's something that blows up when p is not the way you want it to be. Okay? And this is going to play a role because you remember that the Kantorovich problem was about minimizing couplings that had those right marginals. Okay? Remember the Kantorovich soldiers thing was basically, I want to find the best possible matrix that tells me where the troops are moving, but still I need to have some conservation of mass. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to replace this constraint and we're going to do something that we do very frequently in optimization, which is, well, something that's a constraint is the same thing as adding a function of the value p that blows up to infinity if it doesn't satisfy what I want and that is zero otherwise, okay? Here, I'm sure people familiar with optimization room know this trick very well. If you're not, it's, it's very intuitive. Instead of saying, I want this to satisfy this constraint, you say, okay, choose whatever you want. However, whenever it's not going to satisfy the constraint, there will be a penalty of plus infinity. So that makes it not very appealing anyway. So you're never going to look in those, at those points that do not satisfy the constraint. So why do I do this? Well, I do this because this way of reformulating things is a bit easier. So keep in mind this picture. We have double integral of C against DP plus this function, super mm of blah, 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 something a bit long, that blows up to infinity if it doesn't satisfy the constraint I want and stays at zero otherwise. So if I just write all this thing, okay, I write out, I will take the smallest, the coupling with positive values doesn't need to satisfy the marginals. It's cost plus a supremum of many things. Now I'm going to play and switch a bit orders. So the first thing you can see is that it's actually trivial to put the soup before. So I have an if soup of a lot of integrals. Okay? The second thing that I want to do is group the integrals that look easy to manage. So there's one integral against p on the left, one integral against p on the right, and then in the middle there's something. So I'm going to bring back the integral against p on the left. So I'm integrating c minus phi plus psi against p. Okay? Now, on the right hand side, I have what's left, you know, the, the, the phi against mu and psi against mu. Now let's look at this soup over phi psi of c minus phi plus psi, dp. What do you think, oh, sorry. So here is the dirty part that I'm not going to prove. The dirty part that I'm not going to prove is the inf soup inversion. So this is minimax theorem, so this requires a bit of math, so I'm not going to tell you about it. So let's just assume that in this case we can do this, this, this switching. What we have there is something that remains that says <coughs> I'm going to take the infimum over all couplings that are non-negative of this thing, C minus psi, phi plus psi. What do you think about it? Imagine that I tell you, okay, you're going to take any measure, it is positive, and you are free to test it against any other function and uh, I'm going to take the infimum over all couplings of, that, of, that, of, of the, the test again that, that function, okay? Well, if you take the infimum over all couplings, then there's one thing you can notice immediately, is that if there is one value for which C minus this phi plus psi function is positive, 
no, sorry, negative. If it's negative in one value, if it's negative in one value, then you can arbitrarily choose to put a lot of mass on that point, and you will let this diverge to minus infinity. So, in, in short, this infimum is also telling you whether c minus phi plus psi is positive or not. If it's positive, then this is equal to zero. If it's not always positive, and there's one point for which c of x, y minus phi x minus psi y is negative, then it's minus infinity. And this is another way to rewrite a uh, indicator function, and so you can also plug this now back into the into a constraint. So I've just switched a bit between constraints and the and the and the, and the, and, the, and, the, and the optimization uh, objective, and this is the essence of duality. So let me just go back just simply to this. What I just essentially did is I played a game where I rewrote the constraint in the first problem as a supermum or something, I flip things and I recover a different pro program, which is this dual. And I will talk about this dual later because what this tells you is that there's essentially two ways to compute optimal transport. There's one which is directly minimizing in terms of uh, couplings, and there's another one which is also very frequently used, which is min optimizing in terms of test function against those measures with the constraint that those two test functions agree in terms of, of the cost that you're using on the base metric. See, I mean, it's, it's fairly easy to come up with a story with the first Kantorovich uh, problem. If I were to define a story with a dual, it would be a completely different story. Okay? I don't have the time to do it now, but let me just, so let me just uh, follow. So, so I did that. Too far, so. so now for the for the object of uh, that the people you, many people use, which is this idea of passage time distances. So if you've if you've ever heard about optimal transport, usually you hear about passage time distances. So passage time distances is a particular case of this Cantorovich problem where the cost is the distance to some power, and the power is p is a power p bigger than one. So you write W, P, the infimum for all couplings of the integral of P, a coupling, against distance x, y to the power P. Okay? And what is interesting, oh, sorry, is that for this to be a distance, you need to take the power 1 over P on the right-hand side. Okay? So it's a bit like when you define Q norms, you know, where you take uh, sum or the, the norm of a vector, which is uh, sum of x i, absolute value of x i to power q, all of it to the power one over q. When you take the Euclidean norm, it's sum of x i to square, square root, okay? So here's the same thing. We're taking a distance in the middle to the power p, and outside we just normalize it to one over p, and then we can prove that this is a metric. It's a distance between probability distributions, and actually this is a, uh, a a distance which has been studied a lot in, in, in optimal transport. And so very often, to simplify a bit notations, one puts the power p on the Wasserstein distance to remove this 1 over p on the right-hand side. Okay? Just as when we use frequently the squared Euclidean norm, it's easier to manipulate or to play with than the Euclidean norm. So, in the same way, you can also define this... Uh, Wasserstein distance using duality, right? The only thing that I will need to do is replace this cost as a distance to power p. So now here I'm going to describe something which makes Kantorovich duality more than just uh, an alternate way to write things. It's also a tool to study this problem and come up with different interpretations and some, some important results. So there's one thing that you can notice is um, you remember when I'm describing couplings, I am basically describing an object, a mathematical object, which is defined on omega times omega, okay? If I have barracks and front lines, I need to fill up this entire matrix. So I have a, I have a variable which is quadratic with respect to the size of my set. When we define things in terms of the dual, 
we only have two variables which are the same size of the set. Okay, it's a function phi that you again integrate against mu, a function psi that you integrate against mu. And so that makes things a bit simpler in terms of keeping track, you know, keeping a uh, bookkeeping of what, what you're trying to optimize. However, you have a big constraint on those two variables, on those two phi and psi, which is that for every x and y, phi of x plus psi of y must be smaller than the cost between x and y. It turns out that the dual can be even further simplified. And this is one of the big achievements of linear programming. And let me explain to you how you can do this. Let me try to give you a mathematical intuition. So, I hope I haven't lost you all on the dual. Think about this. You have two things to optimize. You want to make a supremum over two functions, phi and psi. You can choose them the way you want. Integrate them against mu and nu, and you have those constraints. Imagine I fix one function. Okay? I am freezing one of the two functions. Let's say phi is not on the table anymore. It's just I have chosen it. You're only free to choose psi. So if you look at the constraints, what exactly do you need from Psi, this blue thing, to work? Well, the only thing that we need from Psi is that for every x and every y, phi of x plus Psi of y is smaller than the distance between x and y. Okay? That's fine. Let's flip things the way we want them. It means that this function Psi needs to satisfy that for every x, y, psi of y is smaller than d of x, y power p minus phi of x. Okay? In particular, I mean, this must be valid for every y, so why not take it for all y's? If you make it for all y's, it's simple. You just say, well, it has to be smaller than something that depends on the y's. Let me take the worst possible one, so that way I'm safe. So I'm going to take the infimum, the smallest, of all y's, of all x's, sorry, of the distance between x and y minus phi of x. Okay? Does that sound reasonable? If you want something to be smaller than a big collection of things, then you can just simply take the smallest of those things and say, my thing is smaller, smaller than the smallest of those things, and that's fine. Right? And so this is the one function that you can come up with for psi. So here I'm playing with colors a little bit. <clears throat> Imagine you give me a red function, phi. There's no better function, if you think about it, that I can come up with than this blue function, which I have obtained by taking this infimum. Okay, I'm playing this infimum game. So this is why I've added a little red bar on top of it. Okay? I start with the red function. I need to choose a blue function. Well, there's no better thing that I can choose than this thing this red function with a blue bar. And this is called the D-transform of phi. Okay? So it's one of the nice tools in, in, in transport that generalizes convexity. And <clears throat> now that I have replaced the best possible blue function by this transform of the red, well, I can actually phrase the problem as a supremum over red functions of the integral of the red functions plus this red function transform into a blue. I mean, the best possible candidate that I can find. It's like the optimal couple that I can, that I can come up with this for this red function. So all of a sudden, the problem seems a bit simpler. I'm taking the supremum of a red functions of something that depends on the red plus something that depends on the red again. But if you look closely, actually, I'm playing with tricks here. Because this blue thing, the, the, this the D transform, is not such a simple thing to handle in a, from an optimization procedure. But still, it's fun to play with this thing. So, again, you're optimizing over two things. If you fix one, then you must choose the other one in such a way because that's the best possible way you can do this. And now we're going to just keep playing with the red one. Imagine that I do this again. For every red function, for every blue function, I can also define a red function in a similar way. Okay, by just taking this, by flipping the, the file upside. And so I can keep on you know, putting those little bars on top of my functions. And the question is, can I keep on doing this forever? Okay, can I actually 
take those D transforms one after the other so that I keep on improving uh, the, 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 this, my solution? And the, the answer is no, because after two iterations of this, basically we're done. You can prove quite easily that this doesn't work. So let me just wrap up a bit this, uh, this, uh, this D transform uh, um, idea in, in optimal transport. There is a way when we are optimizing two things to, if you fix one, to get the possible pair for the other one. And if you do this iteratively, after some point, it doesn't work anymore. And so what we call a function, we call a function D concave if it is itself the transform of another function. Okay? So if you, if you think about the genre transform is in convexity, it's a generalization of that concept. So let's say for the sake of the argument that we are going to minimize, uh, optimize the optimal transfer problem over phi d mu plus phi bar d nu with this, with this d transform. So this leads me, the, way, the reason I'm telling you about all this is because this leads to the only natural way to prove a very important result in optimal transport that people have used in GAN literature and several other works, which is that there is one particular case, which is the Monge case, which can be very nicely formulated mathematically. So let me just phrase the theorem, the proposition says the following. If the cost is the distance, okay, then, so I'm using Monge formalism, and I am considered a function which is itself deconcave, then this best possible pair that I can come up with is actually minus the function itself. And this function phi must be one Lipschitz. So since I'm seeing that I've maybe I've lost a bit your attention there, I will share with you the slides for the proof. You can see that the proof is quite elegant. It's a, just a sequence of small, small statements that basically show you that necessarily, in this case, when the cost is the distance, then this game of playing D transforms is basically equivalent to playing with one Lipschitz functions. Which brings me to this theorem, which is actually very often called the kantorovich rubinstein theorem, which is that the Morse problem can be solved in the following way, by taking the supremum of one Lipschitz functions and testing them against the difference between my, mu x and mu, 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 mu x. Okay. So you remember this was the Wasserstein distance. This is again the story of Kantorovich minimizing the coupling, etc. It turns out that when you are actually using more formalism where the cost is exactly a distance, then computing this optimal transport distance between two measures is, the, is finding the best one Lipschitz function that can test in the most efficient way, the difference between the two measures mu and And this brings me to a formula that you might see a couple of times more during the summer school because I think Arthur Gretton will talk about what people call integral probability metrics of this, of which this is a particular case. Okay? So with this, I will more or less stop using integral signs and double integrals, etc. I hope this was not too... Uh, too painful, and I will revert back very soon to math. Let me just say the, uh, to sorry computations. Let me just say for the last uh, for the last slide on this subject that basically this was related to to a question before. There are a lot of results that say that for well-behaved costs and for well-behaved measures there exists an optimal map between the measures, and there are results that link the optimal coupling with the optimal transport map itself. So if you're interested in that, that type of result, this is essentially work from the late 80s and 90s, and this is, those were the first achievements in the field of optimal transport. Now, let's go back to something a bit, yes? Oh, no, it, it's actually, it's not, no, it's just that Kantorovich discovered this link. Uh, yes. Ah, I have to. Re okay, okay. So the question was, uh, why, uh, why is it linked to Kantorovich? Why did I mention Kantorovich when I introduced this W1 result? So let me go back to this. <coughs> so, 
So again, the, the, the result is when the distance is, when the cost is a distance, we have this formulation and I said that this was due to Kantorovich. And indeed, so I didn't mean that this was related to the Kantorovich formulation. Well, it's a derivation of the Kantorovich formulation. It's, it's a derivation of duality, actually. So if you, to get there, I had to go through, through two steps, which was first to tell you that the Wasserstein problem, the, the optimal transport problem, could be written in a dual form. The dual form has two variables, phi and psi. You can get away with one variable using this C transform trick. And this is what is on the top. On the top, I just said, okay, rather than computing it with respect to phi and psi, I can just remove psi and replace it by something that looks like the best possible match for phi. Okay, the best possible blue for this red turns out to be something that you can define directly using the red. And then it turns out that if the cost is a distance, you can play with this detransform further and show that those things must be, basically the, the thing on the right must be equal to minus the thing on the left. And it must be one Lipschitz. And then you get to this identity. Now, Kantorovich proved it, and Rubinstein proved it. Yes? Because it, it provides a very intuitive way to compute or to visualize what the, oh, so the question was, why is this helpful that we are now restricted to a class of functions which are one Lipschitz? Well, the first, probably the, the easiest answer is before the dual, the way I have defined it, unless you are very aware of optimal transport, this doesn't sound too much like an intuitive constraint. It's one that says, first we have a pair of functions instead of just one. And then for all x and y's, psi of x, phi of x plus psi of y must be smaller than this cost. Then I have switched to something which is, I'm only going to optimize with respect to one function. And instead of integrating against one measure and then one measure, I'm just integrating against the difference. So that also makes it a lot simpler. And then you can probably come up with a lot of computational tricks to basically quantify whether a function is Lipschitz or not. And one of them was used in this wasserstein gan paper. So in the wasserstein gan paper, what they said is optimal transport, blah, 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 blah. Here we use this. Supermember of a function which are one Lipschitz. Okay, we're going to just optimize over neural networks that have bounded weights and with a ReLU with a slope of one. And that makes it somewhat Lipschitz. And then we optimize this difference. So here I'm just trying to highlight one of the scenarios in which things simplify a little bit. Because before things were a bit abstract here, you're basically s testing the worst possible one Lipschitz function against the difference of those two measures. Thank you for the question. Any other question? Okay. Yes? Okay, so when you do this, you get you get the distance, but you don't actually get the transformation, or do you? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, no, you don't. You cannot get the transformation. And you, in this you don't particular care. Case. No, you do care. I mean, sometimes you do care. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there, there are ways you can get it actually. So it's a bit complicated to go back from the dual to the primal, in that sense. But you do care. I mean, it, it depends on who, what you want to do. So in, in the GAN context, what you use, what you recover is not only the, the distance, what you recover in what is really useful in the GAN context is the function phi. Because that gives you a gradient to diminish the value of this Wasserstein distance. It tells you basically, so here, okay, let, let's be a bit conceptual. You have a measure mu, you have a measure nu, you take the difference between the two, and then you're trying to find a function that goes through them, basically, that doesn't vary too fast because it's one Lipschitz. And you're, try and you're trying to find the worst possible one, right? And so what that means is basically when that function is high, it's basically pointing at areas where there is variation between the two that you need to correct to diminish the, to diminish the, the value of the Wasserstein distance. So here you want the, 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 this, this, uh, this uh, people call this Kantorovich potential. Okay, this, this dual variable. But that's different from the map. The map is the one that you know, moved. This is a real valued function. 
the map is something else. And there is a duality between the map and the potential functions, but sometimes you can recover it and sometimes not. And it's the easiest case is when the cost is squared, not when it's uh, just... Uh, so what you gain by doing this one Lipschitz thing makes it a lot harder to connect it to the Morse problem. So that's can, can I ask can a question? Eat. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, are there any constraints on the D, on the distance? Uh, not that I know of. I mean, okay. and, and because the, what, the, essentially, if you look at the proof that is there, the only thing that I'm using is triangle inequalities. Okay. I'm using it here, the fact that it's Lipschitz nets, it's just very, very simple math. So the only thing I'm using is just, just right. triangle inequality. Yes? Uh, so, in this case, on the top, it's horrible to solve it, it's difficult to solve it directly. On the bottom, the one Lipschitz, it's quite intuitive. You're just saying, I have two distributions, I think they're different, and then I'm trying to find one function that doesn't vary too fast, that is the biggest as possible on, on when I integrate against this difference. So as I was, this is related to this idea again of Wasserstein Gans, or there are other works actually before, right, way before Wasserstein Gans that were taking this insight to come up with nice tricks to estimate the Wasserstein distance using wavelets and things like that. So it's simpler. Here, I mean, if you, if you think about, if you have a mental model of everything that I have proposed, I have proposed optimizing directly your couplings. A coupling is a fairly big thing, right? It's those two... Uh, it's, it's a, the product of the space times itself, and then you have to define the joint probability distribution, it's big. Then I used duality to say that we are integrating against two functions, phi and psi, but they are related in this way that phi of x plus psi of y must be smaller than the cost of xy. That's a lot of constraints. And so when you get to W1, this sounds like a fairly simple one, right? I just take the difference between the two measures and, and I integrate against a function of phi, and the function of phi must not move too fast. It must be one Lipschitz, and I take the super. So there's a bit of a, a grade, uh, gradient in terms of difficulty. It's okay. Okay. So now for the, for the, the more interesting or more intuitive part, so here I have defined this geometry. I called it the Wasserstein distance. I have written out infimum of integrals or supermum, infimum of double integrals or supermum of integrals, etc. So it's all quite, still quite abstract at this point, and I haven't gone into computations. But what I would like to emphasize is that basically what we have now is a geometry between probability distributions. So by a geometry, I mean the following. Here I am in the space of all probability distributions, okay? This is the manifold, if you want, where you have all probability distributions on, on omega. I've, the small cartoons that I have on the left and on the right are basically mixtures of Gaussians. I proposed a very flexible way to compute distances between probability distributions by saying, I will find a coupling between them that is the least possible costly. And the cost here depends on basically how expensive it is to move mass from one point to another. So this was, for many years, roughly the, what people were interested about. And uh, this was directly, you can see that this Wasserstein distance is essentially the cost that Kantorovich was seeking to minimize when he was moving soldiers or, or whatever, or Hitchcock or Koopmans or people in the economy. The, the, the breakthrough appeared later in the 90s when people said, but Okay, so we have a geometry, we have a distance between probability distributions, but what's great about the geometry is that usually we can do things that are a bit more exotic than just computing the length of the path that connects them. We can actually try to look at what the path looks like, okay, if it's a geodesic. We can actually look at interpolations between probability distributions with this geometry. And by interpolation, there's several ways you can define them, but one of them is essentially something in between that is not too far from the endpoints, okay? And so, if you look at this picture, this is actually a numerically accurate uh, simulation, what you see is what would be at different snapshots 
the shape of the pile of sand that goes from the left to the right. Okay? If you had like one zillion workers taking their shovels at the same time and lifting at the same time all of the small sand and moving it so that they get to their design, designated position, so if every x goes to t of x, then what you will see is basically this movement where the mass goes from where it is on the left to where it is on the right. And this is what we call a displacement interpolation or this uh, in optimal transport interpolation between probability distributions. And here I would just like to uh, uh, challenge a bit your imagination. This kind of interpolation is very different from the kind of interpolation that we are used to when we do interpolations in a, in a vector Euclidean world. And let me just try to, to, to explain this with this example. Imagine there is a sensor for temperatures which is in this corner and there is a sensor for the temperature of the room which is in that corner. And imagine I look at, at the end of the day, the histogram of temperatures on that day. So that might be, for instance, maybe the blue, the blue peak on the left is temperatures here, and maybe there was more movement of people, or maybe the air conditioning was a bit more erratic there, and, there, and it was a bit warmer there. And so there is this bi slightly bimodal red distribution on the right. Okay? And now someone asks you, we need to post report the average temperature in the room uh, tomorrow. So you have this blue distribution on the left, the bimodal red distribution on the right, and someone tells you average them. You have to come up with one histogram that summarizes everything. So there's one thing you could do, which is to treat those two densities or histograms as just simply vectors on the real line and compute their average or interpolate them. Maybe this one is more important to you, so you want to give more weight to this one and less weight to this one. So this is what you would have. You would have this. Uh, so th this distribution was there. This distribution was there. I'm averaging them. Basically, what I get is I take the sum of the two d densities, I divide by two, and I get those, this very hilly landscape. That doesn't really look like the distribution of temperatures that you would expect to have in a room because there would be some, some kind of discontinuity somewhere in the middle. That doesn't really sound fair. But it's something that's valid mathematically, right? It makes sense. Now, the optimal transport way to do things, this interpolation that I'm trying to give you a, an intuition for, where I move mass laterally, is the thing that's pictured on the right. So on the left, Euclidean interpolation between densities, basically it's more like an elevator game, you know, it's like... A, this goes up, this goes down, okay? And if I want to take the middle, then I take the sum of the two and they're in the middle, and I get two bumps. Optimal transport philosophy is, if I have some bump here and some bump there, if I were to mix them and make some interpolation between the two, then it's as if I was moving the mass on my way from the first one to the second one, and I stopped somewhere. And this is the optimal transport inter interpolation that you have. And I think you can make the argument that this interpolation is very intuitive, the second one, and it works quite well in a few applications. So in graphics, we have shown with Justin and other co-authors that, that those, those interpolations made sense. But there are other fields in data sciences where maybe this kind of interpolation makes sense as well. And I will explain to you how you can actually compute them. And so this is one, uh, one of the first interpolations that we did that we're convincing from a graphics perspective was done with Justin. And here's the game. We have three different shapes in 3D. And those are basically probability distribution in the sense that there is mass inside the volume and zero outside. And we have three of them. And what we try to do is, can we compute the optimal transport interpolation between those three? Can we compute like barycenters, if you want, of those shapes using optimal transport? So we're imagining somewhere where if you want the, you could see those things as gas and then you transport optimally the gas between those, those, uh, those three different shapes. And you ask yourself, what does it look like? And what I would like to insist here is that there is no modeling of shapes or anything. There's no maths involved ex except for optimal transport. And as I told you, the main ingredient in optimal transport is the cost. The cost to move one thing, one grain of sand to another place. And here the cost is the squared Euclidean distance in 3D. So to us, it was quite surprising to see that the results of this were intuitive. They were kind of agreeing with physics. And so this is, this is where we started applying them to other applications. And then there's lots of nice pictures where you can see 
these kind of um, interpolations. Um, so this is not the end. Of course, optimal transfer can be used for more than that. But here, what I would like to uh, give you uh, the sense of is that in this field of optimal transport, and specifically computational optimal transport, for a long time, people were essentially driven by being able to approximate this big double integral that I, that I showed you earlier, or the dual problem. Can we compute this Wasserstein distance? This was the, 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 big, the big goal. And in, the, in recent years, there's been a lot of progress on doing that. And so we're slowly moving away from that goal, and we're trying to do more interesting, challenging things, which is to play with this Wasserstein geometry to do not only just is a measure close to another, but to ask ourselves the question, can I bring this measure closer to this one in Wasserstein sense? So this is related to these Gantt problems, and, but it's not only Gantt. There's only all, all, many other problems that you can, you can, you can ask yourself in, for instance, the Bayesian setting, when you want to simulate from a posterior, you're going through prior, can you actually drift towards the posterior and make it closer and closer to the posterior? There's a lot of applications where actually we're trying to minimize a function of the Wasserstein distance between two distributions or two measures. And this was actually, again, this is where the nice maths kick in. This was where very well studied and discovered in the 90s by, by, by mathematicians. So some of them are, are, are listed there. And they define basically the geometry of uh, space of probability distributions under this Wasserstein distance. So before we get there, uh, I need at some point to explain roughly how we can compute things and how can we get as close as possible to the actual value of optimal transport. So I will describe basically what are the cases where we want to do optimal transport, we want to compute, and I will explain the easy cases and the more complex ones. Any questions? Yes? Yes. Or this one, yeah. Uh, this one or the one afterwards actually is probably yeah, okay. more serious. You're also changing topology, right? In the top left corner, you're changing the topology. So here, is here, that a here the four corners are actually fixed. Okay. No, no. I'm, I just mean you go from a uh, ah, yes. from, from disconnected components yes, 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 to. Yes, yes, yes. So is is that? No, it's it's pure luck. Uh, but should you be worried about it? Be uh, no, I think it's uh, no. I'm, 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 for that one, no, I'm not worried. But, but wait, so wait. It, it doesn't it doesn't uh, mean anything to change topology in that sense. I mean, if you were to think about so, if you just only focus on the left column, leftmost column, basically what you get is an optimal transport interpolation between something that's split in the beginning and then it's in the end to reach something that's joined, right? You have those two things on the top left. And gradually, it seems that they start taking the shapes of those stars and at the same time get closer and closer and closer until they actually join. But does the point where it meets, does it mean yes. anything? Is that kind of a phase transition or a... Okay, so you have a very good question. Uh, the fact that they split like this means somewhat that um, if you were to go backwards from this to this, you can see that typically the map that starts sending the mass is not Lipschitz at all, in the sense that if you were unlucky to be right in the middle, your left friend, your right friend, left friend left there, and you are living there. And so the Morge map, if you want, is completely disconnected. And this is the big subject of regularity theory that was tackled by Figali. So Figali got the Fields Medal in part for his work on this, on this kind of, of a study of the regularity of optimal transport. So the question was, Okay, let's take two, two measures. Let's assume a few things about them. Can we prove that necessarily the optimal transport that we will get has some nice regularity properties, Lipschitz, Ness, and things like that. And so this is very, very, it's deeper math. But uh, here, this is a numerical illustration which basically shows that it does what we want. We, we, I mean, we were kind of happy to see that that was the result. Yes. Uh, you said that there is a problem with the Monsch formulation, but yes. how do you like explain the same like movement of the mass if you have a Dirac and you have a continuous probability measure yes. uh, with the Cantorovich formulation? 
Like you said that it, it well, if you had one Dirac, you would split, you would split the mass in all directions towards this continuous formulation. Well, actually, you can symmetrize it. I mean, so if you go from one Dirac, so this is a bit, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm playing a bit with game, a bit here, but if you go from one Dirac to a continuous, it's a big problem. If you go from continuous to one Dirac, it's obvious, right? You just bring all of the yeah. mass to this Dirac. So in some way, the more formulation is not completely, in this case, uh, um, it's not imposed completely. It's kind of asymmetric. But for Kantorovich, it's just going from one Dirac and sending all the mass to everyone, or just having a coupling that collapses to one point. And so it's completely symmetric. And that's one, that's one of the reasons why Kantorovich is nice as well. Thank you. Yes, so maybe I didn't say this, but when I wrote the Morse formulation, it was asymmetric, right? I was assuming that I was starting from some measure mu, and I was sending t through t to a measure nu, right? And in Kantorovich, actually, you can flip both orders, it doesn't change anything. Mu and nu, or nu and nu is the same. Uh, sorry, maybe uh, a bit more stupid question. So here, from red to blue, you go through the purple, but uh, on the previous slide, uh, you go from red to blue with the green. So, um, so uh, you mean the color is not accurate? That might be. Uh, I think, I no, think I just like expect the purple uh, to be between the red and blue, like on the next picture. You mean ah, uh, you mean the the blue? So here it's a mixture of three colors, right? So it's red, green, and blue. So it's green mixed with blue. Green, I mean, it's a mixture of those three three RGBs. So you would expect to see which color pop up. Uh, so uh, you, you don't move from the blue to red, yeah? So you just yes, yes, yes. From oh, blue to I red, this is this is this line basically. Oh, okay. This is this is uh, the the duck that morphs into a cow. This is the cow that morphs into a ring. This is the ring that morphs into a uh, to a duck. And to be fair, Justin is there. So if you have, <laughs> so he's not happy with it. Okay, same one, same. Um, so in here you have the interpolation yes. um, using the Wasserstein yes. distance. Yes. Um, do you have one using KL or Euclidean? Uh, well, I can. You can the, the Euclidean you can very easily imagine it, right? It's just you sum up those three things and divide by three. So you will basically see some kind of slightly <laughs> stronger ring. A slow, stronger cow or a slow, smaller cow, depending on the, 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 the strength of the, the weight, right? Euclidean is, is kind of easy, right? I mean, if you... KL, on the other hand, blows up there. I mean, depending on whether you use left KL or right KL, because there was one which is mode-seeking mode and mode-avoiding and things like that. But usually, the big problem with KL... In, I mean, for this kind of examples, this is the perfect scenario to show that transport makes sense compared to KL. It's the best one because there is a lot of geometry there. Here it's in three dimensions. So obviously here things will be very degenerate for kullback liber So if you think about the kullback liber geometry, the very important thing about the kullback liber geometry is that somewhat the measures overlap. You're, you're looking at the ratio of two densities. So if one of the densities in the bottom goes to zero, then KL goes to infinity and it breaks down. And this is exactly what transport can handle very well. It can handle very well the fact that the densities have uh, disjoint supports. Are you essentially saying that KL is just one No, I don't think it would morph. I would think it blew up in the middle. There is some point where, where it would need to have some mass here, and it would need to have some mass where it's zero somewhere else, and so it would blow up, basically. It can? Yes. Yes. But, but essentially, it's because those three distributions, you will find an area where one of them is, has mass and the other has none. And so you will not be able. Yes. You, well, okay, let, if you wanted to play a bit, let's say they're just slightly apart. They're not centered. Okay, they're just like this. 
and you want to have this, this, op, op, this interpolation in space, then in the middle there's nothing that can happen. So, uh, a question? Yes? Yes. Then you can first move one component of the distribution completely there by some amount and then start uh, moving the rest of them. Ah, ah so you, you mean so basically you put some workers on holidays while yeah, some workers exactly. are working, etc. Uh, I, you, you could think about this, but this adds a time component and a time scheduling component that usually is not, taken care, uh, is not considered here. So what you do is just simply assume that every worker is working at the same rate at the same time. So for instance, if you will assume that between time zero and one, every worker needs to start where it starts and land where it needs to land, and then continues monotonically, basically regularly at the same speed, basically. Everybody moves at the same speed along the, along the geodesic. No, not at the same speed, sorry, but uh, which is the same, yeah, exactly, distance of after time one, has to arrive, so it will be different speeds, but they will be constant. That's what I want. What I meant. Okay. Oh. Sorry. No. So your question is: Do we? Uh, can we? Can we keep the fact that basically the density is constant? And zero elsewhere. Do we keep the fact that it's a shape throughout the interpolation? Uh, to, to keep the fact that there's, let's say, one kilogram per cube centimeter. Uh, no, that's no. So no, that's okay. not that's not the case. So this is why optimal transpose somewhat works, and uh, people in graphics like it, but don't think it's actually the ultimate answer to the problem, because we put so little assumptions, we get very little guarant guarantees actually. And we don't get the guarantee that throughout this, basically the mass inside is uniform. So in all of those interpolations, we start from things that are uniform, but there might be, and actually there are, cases where maybe the mass will concentrate in some areas and will, uh, will be less, it's a bit like a gas, basically. Mm. You have, you're not making some incompressible fluid constraints. Okay? Okay. There are formulations of optimal transport. We can look at optimal transport as a relaxation of those incompressible fluid dynamics. And those are also actually uh, very interesting from an optimal transport point of view, were studied by Brunier and other authors. But it, it, it's a lot heavier uh, in terms of computations first and mathematically as well. Okay, okay. so let me just maybe start a bit with uh, what I will be talking about this afternoon, which is computations. And let me just start maybe with uh, a bit of a a panorama of what's going on. So one of the nice things about optimal transport, I find, and this goes a bit to, back to the question about kullback library divergence. Well, if you know kullback library divergence, you know that there is a difference between whether you're playing with the kullback library divergence between discrete measures or continuous measures. And in particular, you cannot compute the kullback library between two discrete measures if, if somewhat their support do not overlap. Okay? You cannot compute the KL of one Dirac and another Dirac. What's very nice in optimal transport is that the definition of Kantorovich, not that of Morse, because that of Morse has a few issues with Dirac's, but the definition of Kantorovich is the same for everyone. No matter if you're comparing Dirac masses, continuous distributions, whatever, there is always going to be one coupling that's going to connect the two, and you're going to optimize over those couplings, and since there's at least one that's feasible, the problem works. It's not imposed. So there's Usually three different regimes that people like to single out <coughs> Sorry. in optimal transport. And the first one is discrete to discrete. You're comparing two, so it's a bit this, the, the picture from Kantorovich, the, 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 the soldiers. There's the discrete to continuous, which has a lot of relevance in statistics, because a lot of what we do is basically trying to fit continuous models on discrete data. And then there's the continuous to continuous, which is very challenging, of course, because it assumes uh, uh, infinite knowledge on the densities themselves. And just to uh, 
give a broad, I mean, very loose description. Basically, the discrete-to-discrete -discrete problem can be solved with network flow, network flow, sorry, network flow uh, solvers, typically simplex method. And I will describe this uh, uh, ne next. The discrete-to-continuous is a lot more complicated. And there has been a lot of effort on that side in, the, in recent years, especially from people in graphics and from some industry which is called reflector design, which tries to shape the to define the shape of mirrors in your cars, you know, where you have the lights that are projected and, uh, and you have light beams that go out of your car. This is actually done through some work on the reflectors and optimal transport is also related to that. And this discrete to continuous problem is very relevant for them. So a bit of stats, a bit of this, a bit of graphics. A few people are interested in this problem. And then the continuous to continuous problem is actually very hard, as you can imagine. And it has motivated people in the field of PDs, partial differential equations. So I'm not going to talk about this, but there is a, if you're interested, if you know about PDs, you might know about the mont jean equation, which is related to the, which is the, the name for optimal transport in this community. Now, I will essentially talk about the network flow solvers approach, the discrete to discrete approach, and I will tell you basically what's wrong with it after. But before we go into all those, uh, those considerations, let me just try to single out some problems where computing optimal transport is trivial. Okay, so for a change, it will make things nice and, and simple. So one of the, the most, I think, important identities in optimal transport is the following. It says, if you have your space is the real line, okay, omega is R, the cost between X and Y is a translation invariant cost, which is a cost function applied to the difference between X and Y, absolute value. The cost, this C function here is convex. Then optimal transport between two distributions, two densities on the real line, is only basically a very elaborate way, complicated way, to say that we're dealing with their quantile functions. Okay? And the identity is as follows. The Wasserstein distance between mu and u is the integral of the cost function applied on the difference between the quantiles. So let me try to parse this out for you visually. I have two distributions, mu and u, okay, two densities. So remember, here I'm just on the real line. Okay? I'm, I'm in the most simple case. Basically, I'm, I'm back to the case of Monge, in the, the cartoon of Monge, where I have a pile of sand and another pile of sand, and I want to morph one to the other. What I do is, there's many ways you can represent the density. One of them is through the cumulant density function, the CDF. Okay, you're just integrating the density between minus infinity and x, and that gives you the CDF at x. If the density is well behaved, another way to represent the very same thing, yes? Yeah, so, 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 it, it, so, so the lunch is starting now, right? No, you do five minutes break only for you to rest. I'm uh, to make an announcement. Uh, but, uh, I mean, but, but there is a lunch after? No, no. But this this is, is also lunch, but, it's but this is the... Five minutes break, and then you continue, and but, then we'll have lunch. I, I, so I, From 12.30 to 12.35, small break of five minutes. But then I finish at what time? Um, before lunch. So and when lunch is what, when? Uh, when okay, hour. so... <laughs> Uh, you're used to densities the way they are. Let's switch to a quant uh, CDF perspective. So CDF is just basically the integral of that. And now let's take the inverse of the CDF, and we call this a quantile function, right? So the CDF goes is a function that goes between minus infinity to infinity, and it's valued between 0 and 1. The quantile is a function that is valued between 0 and 1, and takes values in minus infinity to plus infinity. So the great thing about optimal transport is that actually the only thing you do when you compute the Wasserstein distance between two measures, so this idea of morphing things, you know, on the real line in terms of distributions, is strictly equivalent to actually playing with the quantile functions and comparing them. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense. Because if you want to do optimal transport on the real line, it means you have a cost to compare two values. So you remember that if I wanted to do a mixture of the histogram of temperatures there and the histogram of temperatures there, there is some large sample. Yes. 
to recover this, the density of this, of this mixture. So this is just one, one very interesting point, and I will show later that it has been used a lot. There is another very nice case where transport is easy to compute, and it's a bit like with Kullback library, uh, Kullback library divergences. It's a, it's a nice uh, uh, feature of Gaussian distributions that if you compute the Wasserstein, so here I must say that this only applies when the cost is the squared Euclidean distance. So it's uh, quite restrictive. So if you compute what people call the Wasserstein 2, or 2 Wasserstein, so the cost is squared Euclidean distance, then if you compute this distance between a Gaussian with a mu, uh, with a measure, uh, sorry, mean M mu and covariance matrix sigma mu, and another Gaussian that I wrote here, m nu and sigma nu, then the Wasserstein distance between the two is something that splits the information of the means and the covariances apart. It basically says the two Gaussians are far as, as far as their means are, plus a distance between their covariance matrices. And this distance between covariance matrices is called the Burr's distance. So here you see that this is a nice and simple way to compute things. And this burst distance is given in the following form. is the trace of the first covariance matrix plus the second minus something that mixes those two covariance matrices together. And this is one 
results which I think will agree with your knowledge about Gaussians, which is that the optimal transport way to go from one Gaussian to another is a linear map. And what this linear map does, essentially, is that it, so imagine you're going from the first Gaussian, m mu, uh, sigma mu, to the second one. So the first thing you would do in this map is you remove the first mean to center this x, you multiply it by a, and what this matrix A is doing is essentially whitening your data and then coloring it again by putting it the covariance matrix that you want. So it first cancels out the effect of the covariance matrix of the first measure and then inserts the covariance matrix of the second measure. And then once you have something that is a white noise colored with the covariance matrix sigma nu, you recover a Gaussian by adding again back the mean of the second measure. So it's, it's very intuitive what, what, what happens. And it's actually uh, very, very simple to go back to, to standard knowledge about the Gaussians. We know that if something has a distribution m sigma, then if you multiply this random variable x by a covariance matrix, uh, matrix C and you add another vector, then you get something that has a covariance matrix C sigma C transpose and the mean C M plus B. So this is what the optimal transport map looks like and this is one of the rare cases where actually we, it's very easy to visualize the transport map. So here we have a first Gaussian on the left and a second Gaussian on the right. What I'm actually displaying here, those arrows are things that tell me where the mass, the sand exactly at that Gaussian should go to eventually recreate the second order, order Gaussian on the right. So here is, I will take advantage of this picture to talk again about the Brunier th theorem. So there's one thing about this map which you can notice is that it's essentially a linear map. Okay, it's 2x, I associate something which is x minus a vector, I multiply a matrix, and then I add. And there's one thing about this matrix A which you can very easily notice is that this matrix A is positive definite, right? If you look at it, it is the product on the left and the right of the same matrix, which is itself positive definite, it's symmetric, and in the middle it's just a product of positive definite matrices. So this matrix here, A, is positive definite. So what can you say about this map T? Well, it is a linear map and the linear component is a positive definite matrix. So what can you say about a map which is linear and the component here, the linear component is a positive definite matrix? Well, you can see it as the gradient of a convex function. Okay, here I'm just rewriting things. I just wrote that basically my, uh, so maybe I should have written it as a U to keep consi notations consistent. I'm just saying that this map which 2x associates another vector, you can see it as simply the gradient of this quadratic form. Okay, the map is linear, so it's the gradient of a quadratic form, and the quadratic form is this one. And here I have displayed it on the top. And so what this function is, this is a convex function, this is called the Brunier potential. This is the function whose gradient gives me the optimal transform map. So this is just a parenthesis to, to connect again with, with, the, with the body theorem. And let me just say, this is a bit technical, but this result that I just showed, that linear maps are optimal, does not apply only to Gaussians, it also applies to a generic family of distributions known as uh, elliptically contoured distributions. And those are densities that you can essentially write as functions of covariance matrices and which have elliptic uh, contour plots, okay? So all of this applies. So in the Wasserstein geometry, you can very easily compare, for instance, uh, uniform ellipsoid. And by uniform ellipsoid, I mean anything that can be written as uh, an ellipsoid. It might be an ellipsoid in smaller dimensions. So it might be a dimension, ellipsoid in dimension three, ellipsoid in dimension two, ellipsoid in dimension one, or an ellipsoid in dimension zero, which is just a point. And in this particular plot, which is accurate, what we have is 
four, five actually uh, measures. One is the elliptic uniform measure on the top left, and then I have four other measures which are equidistant. They have all of the same distance from this top left measure, and you can see one that is full-bodied, uh, a flat thing, a segment, and a point, and all of them are the same distance from this top left. And all of this is basically following this 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 uh, definition that I introduced. So now let's move on to something that is uh, a bit uh, more fundamental, which is I've talked to you about this optimal transport geometry, but I've never really looked at what it outputs in the most simple of cases, which is when the probability distribution is just one Dirac. What is the Wasserstein distance between two Dirac's? Well, in that case, if you work out the mass, it's very easy to see that there's only one coupling that you can define between two Dirac's, and that's just one coupling that is exactly on X and Y at the same time. So the counter-reach problem somewhat collapses to just one possible admissible coupling, and then you can define the distance directly this way. So we didn't have found out whether... I hope the buzz doesn't bother you too much. <laughs> it's a bit tiresome. So the Wasserstein distance here between the two Dirac's is collapses, if you want, to the distance between X and Y. And this is a very nice property. Because think about what you could define if you were using the Euclidean distance. So the Euclidean distance between two Dirac's doesn't really make sense. If you integrate it, it's either 0 or 2. But whatever the Dirac's are, it will never be able to tell them apart. And the Kullback library divergence doesn't even exist between two Dirac's. Okay? So in the Wasserstein case, this is what I was talking about, lifting the base metric of the ground space. If you have points, you can define a distance between them. If you lift them in the space of probability distributions that are infinitely concentrated on those points, you use the Wasserstein distance, you recover the distance between those two points. So this is a, like a meta-argument that is very, very uh, useful. Now, imagine that I'm again in this Kantorovich problem, but this time, all of the factories, I have the same number of uh, barracks that have front lines, and let's say all of the front lines need exactly the same number as uh, there are uh, people in the factories. So it's the uniform case. So I have, let's say, four front lines, four barracks, and each of them holds 10,000 soldiers. Well, in that case, solving the optimal transport problem is just simply what people in computer science call the optimal assignment problem. It's essentially a one-to-one -one mapping where you're trying to find an, uh, an assignment for each red to each blue, and this is just a problem that you can cast as a problem over the space of permutations. So optimal transport generalizes the idea of optimal assignments. Now, the one thing we will be computing very often is optimal transport between two empirical measures, and this is just simply, again, I'm putting this again and again, but it's just this Kantorovich example where you have the soldiers and the and uh, moving from barracks to front lines. Here, I'm just using a bit more mathematical notation. I will write on the left a measure which is red points with sticks. All the AIs are the lengths of the sticks, and the XIs are where the crosses are located. Okay? So XI stands for location on this map, uh, on this manifold. Delta XI is a Dirac at that location, and AI is just the length of the Dirac. And then on the left, I have N points. On the right, I have M points with weights BJs and YJs. And then I just want to find an optimal transport between them. And if you have still in mind the, the example with Kantorovich, well, you will remember that essentially it boils down to two things, just two things. One of them is defining a, a pairwise distance matrix or pairwise cost matrix. Here I put it as a distance. I'm comparing Xi to Yj. This is basically the geometry. I'm encoding all of the geometry of this problem just simply by looking at pairwise how far each Xi is each to each Yj. So this is geometry. The other thing that I'm looking at is mass, conservation of mass. So I'm looking at matrices whose row sums are equal to A and column sums are equal to B. And then I'm minimizing the dot product in Frobenius sense, that is the sum of Pij's 
distance to x i y j. And this is just a linear program. And if you look at optimization textbooks, you will find out that this is a typical problem that people introduce in the literature to motivate optimization. Now, if you look at the dual of this problem, I explained a bit about the dual, you will find again that it's something that can be cast instead of having this coupling matrix, it's just two vectors of size n and m. You remember phi m psi from the earlier, our earlier um, explanation? Well, here you will find basically that there's a dual problem, but I'm not going to detail it too much. Let me just skip a bit this to go back to one thing, which is the way you solve the optimal transport problem is essentially using a network flow solver. It's, uh, and I, there's a lot of algorithms that are specialized to do this. There's also an algorithm called the auction algorithm. There's a variety of algorithms. So they're all basically super cubic in the dimension of your, of your problem. So by this, I, I mean the following. We have n m variables, okay, the coppings of size n m. And what I'm telling you is that we can more or less expect to spend n m times n plus m log n plus m. So that's not too bad, right? Let's say, let, to simplify the argument, let's say that n is equal to m. So this is n cube log n. So you have a problem with n square variables, and I'm telling you, you need n cube time to solve it. As optimization problems go, it's not such a big cost, right? Not, not such a big bump. And the reason why we have this very nice property is because this linear program has a lot of structure. So that's for, if you're an optimization-minded person, this is the half full glass, right? You can see that this is a hard problem. We know that uh, convex optimization is not so easy, but here we have something that is actually very efficient. And there's lots of solvers, commercial free, that are specialized to do this. Now, maybe it's a bit annoying. Um, now, if you are from a machine learning background, this sounds like suicide, right? I mean, you have some problem which is cubic in the number of points. Nobody is going to consider this. This doesn't make sense in large-scale applications. So you need to get around something that will help you improve the speed. And this is what we will be discussing. The other problem that you should have in mind is that if we want to use the Wasserstein distance as a loss function, so you want to use it somewhere in your learning problem, then what we like is to define loss functions that are differentiable. And think about it. One of the big problems with linear programming is that the solution of a linear program is very unstable in the parameters of the, of the optimization. By this, I'm not saying that the value of the objective, the optimal objective is unstable. I'm saying the optimal solution itself. And the optimal solution is typically what plays a role when we try to differentiate <coughs> this quantity. So let me just try to show this to you in, as, a, as a cartoon. Imagine I perturb a little bit anything in this problem. So I'm going to choose to perturb x, okay, the point. So this will make the, opti the, the cost matrix wiggle a little bit. And as long as I don't wiggle too much, basically I'm still recovering the same optimal solution. But there, there will come one moment where I will wiggle it so much that essentially there will be an infinite number of solutions. In linear programming, we say that a vertex a solution is no longer a unique vertex, but it becomes a facet. Okay, there's all the entire the entire facet becomes optimal. And when that happens, you have an infinite number of solutions. So in practice, if you were to run your solver, usually it would never happen because of the beauty of playing with continuous data. However, what happens is that at one second, your optimal solution was in some vertex, and right the, 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 the second after that, it has jumped to another location. And this means that this is, what the, this is the instability that I'm talking about when I'm referring to the fact that the Wasserstein distance between the inputs, mu and nu, when you 
computed on empirical measures, on discrete measures, is not a differentiable quantity. The optimal, if the optimal solution pops, pops up and, and jumps around, it means that the function is not differentiable. So this is one problem. And if you want to also look at it from a, the perspective of a programmer that wants to use this optimal transport within his or her code, you know, in TensorFlow, well, you will not be very happy to learn that any very basic earth movers distance, this is called the earth movers distance here, but any basic network flow solver is at least a few thousand lines long. So if you, think, if you like to think about neural networks that can be backpropagated end to end, etc., etc., this is a nightmare. It's something that will be very difficult to actually play with. So the, 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 the thing that I would like to point out is first, computationally, if you directly translate the idea so of Kantorovich into an algorithm, what you end up with is maths from the 50s where people were actually very, very keen on solving optimal transport with a uh, network flow. And for computational reasons, this doesn't work. And I will also show that for statistical reasons, this doesn't work as well. So what we need is not math from the 50s, it is math from the 60s. <laughs> so there's one thing that when you do, uh, when, you, when you try to convince people of the interest of some function, you know, the new kid in town, the new function, <coughs> and you want to use it in a, in a machine learning context, there's usually two things that people care about. And I would like to discuss those two, which is computational efficiency and statistical efficiency. These two things are important. Why? Because in machine learning, most of the time, what we have access to is samples. Okay? In some fields of science that are very low dimensional, you can hope to completely fill the space of your observations with, observa with measurements and have a very, very accurate idea of what's going on. In data science, it's usually we observe points in dimension, let's say 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, and we will never hope to have an accurate idea, exact accurate idea of what the density looks like everywhere. This, this is the, basically the curse of dimensionality. So when we do things with probability distributions, it makes sense that what we compute using samples, first, can be computed quickly, and second, is somewhat statistically efficient in the sense that when we are doing those computations on the samples, we hope that somewhat it's meaningful in terms of the underlying densities. So let me just uh, explain this mathematically. In machine learning, we will always assume that we have IID samples from, I mean, not, not always IID, but let's say in this case, IID, X1 extends from some distribution mu, Y1, Yn, Ym from some distribution mu, we observe discrete distributions. So the first thing you can ask is, okay, you're talking so much about the Wasserstein distance. Is it useful? Is it efficient? Well, the first thing I want to know is, it is, is it easy to compute? So that's what I basically describe. You can compute it in n plus m times nm times log n plus m. This is a computational property. How expensive is it to compute it exactly or maybe approximate it? The other thing that is important to have in mind is this statistical property. It's essentially, I am going to look at reality through samples. However, I know that there is some underlying density there. Does it make sense to actually accurately compute the Wasserstein distance between the samples if it doesn't look at all like the actual Wasserstein distance between the densities? And so this is more like the sample complexity. And so you would like to have an idea of, on average, since I'm always in this probabilistic world where I'm sampling points, what is the difference? What can I expect the difference between the true densities, the true Wasserstein distance between the densities to be with respect to the, to the sample one? And I would like to bound this. Well, it turns out that from the computational side, I already gave you some pretty bad news. It's difficult to compute the exact optimal transport between those two discrete measures. From the statistical complexity world, world, the news is much worse, actually. It says the following, and there's a huge literature on this, so I cannot detail all of the results that people have been thinking about, especially when they start adding up a lot of assumptions on the densities, whether the densities are smooth or not, what is the cost, etc. But essentially, 
there is a very pessimistic consensus that it's very, very hard to approximate the vast Einstein distance between two densities in high dimensions using samples. So if you approximate, so think about it. I told you that on the real line, basically, vast Einstein distance is essentially about comparing quantile functions. It's not so difficult to estimate the quantile function of a density using samples. There are a lot of statistical results for that. The problem is when you start using optimal transport in dimension that's higher than four or five or six, basically all of the theoretical results tell us that it's going to be very difficult and the quality of the approximation we get is of the order of one over n power one over d. So it's the power one over d here that kills everything. So this is really a curse of dimension in type of result where you need an exponential number of points in dimension. Okay? When you increase dimension, you need to have exponentially more samples to get the same approximation quality. And there's a huge literature on this. So this goes back to the, there's lots of uh, relationships between uh, quantization, the literature on k means and things like that, and Wasserstein. And a lot of the results that I'm talking about here actually come from quantization. So. So I've been spending maybe two hours telling you optimal transport is great, it's a great thing, it's a fantastic thing. And then I'm telling you, well, actually when you compute it, it's horrible because it's cubic. And actually using it would be stupid because what you're actually computing with cubic time is nowhere near what actually would be the vast Einstein distance between the densities. So you might ask yourself rightfully what I have done here this morning, right? What, 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 what was I listening to apart from the, the dream you know, of, a, of this thing? Well, the thing is, there is a way to correct for all this, and this is where the difference between maths and applied math, or I would say data sciences, kick in. The optimal transport theory is a beautiful theory, and it, it is very well defined and very well studied when you actually compare uh, continuous densities. Now, if you want to use it in real life, you should not use the tools that were defined by mathematicians directly, especially in high dimensions. So if you want to use it in 1D, 2D, or 3D, I think you can make a case that you can gather enough information about what you're studying so that you have enough samples, so many samples, maybe one zillion samples. Well, I mean, you can actually have 100,000 samples from this shape that you have completely full out the, fill out the space so that this statistical problem does not kick in. But if you want to use it in higher dimensions, basically, what these results point to is we need to have something that looks a bit more like, you know, the proportional assignment of soldiers and a bit less like this over-engineered and over-optimized approach where we're really shooting for this corner in the, in, in the, in the, in the transportation polytope. So there's been, so t what I would like to explain is that there, ever since optimal transport has been used in, the, in data sciences, there's always been this kind of uh, discourse where people would use the math and say the math is nice, but we have a hard time computing it, so let's do some hack and you will see things are faster. To me, it's, it's maybe not necessarily the good viewpoint. To me, the good viewpoint is to say that we are dealing with data which is intrinsically noisy, and so it doesn't make sense to actually compute optimal things or that optimal things when the data is noisy, and so you might as well stop before or just put some limitations on your optimization to recover something that is a bit more stable. And if you look at the literature in optimal transport, there's been a lot of things that were presented as hacks, which to me actually boil down to, let's just constrain a bit the power of our optimization to get something that, that is more robust and maybe less overfitting to the samples. So there's been, um, so the, 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 I was discussing this, you can constrain the, the function class for the, for the potentials, you can look at this W1 formulation and constrain the class of one Lipschitz functions that you are willing to model, and you can also look at the primer problem, you can start making assumptions on the cost function to simplify it, maybe you can threshold the cost function, you can start playing with the measures themselves. Maybe you can simplify them. For instance, instead of computing the transport between the two-point clouds, you could do something very natural, which is to use k-means first, to discretize a bit your measures, and then do transport between the k-means, the, the quantized measures. There's lots of ideas. 
You can also project on random subspaces or random lines, etc. So I will be talking about one approach in particular today, or two approaches, which is, one is called entropic regularization, and this was the joke about the, the math from the 60s, because it's an idea that's, that's been around for at least 50 years. And the other approach is this uh, slice or projected uh, Wasserstein distance. So I have to be a bit fast, because I think I would probably maybe take five or 10 minutes more Otherwise, the, the, the tutorial this afternoon will be, uh, you will not have enough content for the tutorial this afternoon. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hungry and I'm sure you all are, but we need a bit, uh, we need those five minutes. So, the idea, again, is not only is it too costly to solve transport, but it's, it's doomed to fail. It doesn't work if, it's dimension, if the dimension is higher than three or four. We know this because of people in statistics have been thinking this, this through. So what we can propose is to uh, kill two birds with one stone and essentially try to come up with a formulation, an optimization problem that is easier to solve and maybe, and this I will explain this later on, can also provide us with statistical guarantees. So if you want, my wish list, if I look at this from an applied perspective, is why care about reaching this vertex? which is really the philosophy of linear programming, if I were able to get somewhere that's not too far from the optimum at an order of magnitude faster, okay? And this is the idea of regularization, and I'm quoting a, an economist from the 60s. In economics in the 60s, people were using optimal transport. They were saying, okay, we have this marginal distribution of people when they leave and they, they work in the morning, and this is where they go when they, when they, sorry, when they leave their house. This is where they go to work. People are super rational, so they must communicate between each other. So this, the, the transport that we should observe should be actually the optimal transport solver, the result of the optimal transport solver that we, that we get computing things. And then they were, of course, seeing that actually things were a lot fuzzier than that. People are not exactly following the optimal transport because they were not it was more a free movement, right? So if you let people actually move freely, they will not, not do something that is that optimal. It will be somewhat a bit optimal. And then they would say, okay, actually, what they're actually doing is not optimal transport. They're doing something called the gravity model. They're actually minimizing something which is minimize the cost of, of transport, yet we want a bit of fuzziness. And the fuzziness is quantified as entropy. So why is it natural to introduce entropy here? Well, remember the joint coupling, P, is a matrix that sums to one. It's a probability distribution on the space, on the product space. So entropy is very natural here as a regularizer. And if you look at entropy, it's strongly, one strongly concave on the simplex. So here what I'm doing is I took a linear program and I just regularized it with a function which is minus a concave function, so it becomes a, a convex function. So I'm turning a linear program into something that is strongly convex. Okay? So I'm switching completely gears in terms of optimization. I'm, 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 I'm using a completely different set of tools. And if you look at what happens, well, if you ask for more entropy from the joint coupling, what essentially you're saying is, I want to move away from this idea that the Monge map, you know, one-to-one -one mapping works. I want something that's fuzzy. And how can you observe this? Well, you can observe this by simply plotting what the optimal transport solution looks like as gamma increases. So on the left-hand side, you have zero entropy. And what you get is here, I've, this was computed using a small histogram. The optimal transport matrix is this matrix of size 100 times 100, which is very sparse, which essentially is telling you that we are in the Monge regime where one thing is assigned to one thing, and that's it. And then as you start increasing gamma, what you see is blur. And the blur appears not like randomly or isotropically, where you start blurring everything a little bit, it focuses on areas where it can blur, yet the cost doesn't change too much. This is the main purpose of this regularization, which is that it will start basically making things a bit blurry, 
if the cost is not too impacted. And then when you let gamma go to infinity, you only recover the coupling that has maximal entropy. And what is the coupling with maximal entropy? It's just a product of the margin. So if I go back to my analogy with Kantorovich, remember, there were two, one naive way and one very optimized way to do the allocation of troops. The very naive way that you had pointed out, I'm just trying to, I think it was you, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the very naive way that, you, that, that, that was pointed out is basically I split evenly everyone and I send all the troops evenly. This is the case where gamma goes to infinity, maximal entropy, product of the, product of the marginals. And the case where gamma goes to zero is the optimal one. It's the, the, the old-fashioned, let's just solve the linear program and point towards this P star. And what I'm basically proposing here is to interpolate between the two. And it wouldn't make sense to interpolate between the two if this was not a computationally efficient approach. And it is for the following reasons. I'm not going to detail too much this, but let me just summarize. If you use basic optimization, you will find out that the solution has a very nice factorization. This is what just simply writing out the, the optimality conditions for this problem provide us. You recover something that you had never seen before, which is that the optimal solution of this regularized problem has one very specific shape. It must be a diagonal matrix, a matrix K, and a diagonal matrix. And the only thing that you don't know is what are the values in those di two diagonal matrices. What you know is what this K matrix is. And the K matrix is exponential of minus the, the cost. So you can call it a kernel matrix. This is why we call it a kernel. Here it's blue and red because it's, it basically contains all of the geometry between the points x's and the y's. And so once you know that the solution has this particular shape, the only thing you need to actually enforce is that this matrix has the right row sums and column sums. And to enforce that, what you get is just two sets of uh, two nonlinear equations, and what tells you, well, this matrix times the, ve the vector of 1 is equal to A, this is the row sums. This matrix times the vector of 1 uh, is equal uh, to B, so this is the column sums. So if you do a little bit of math, just very simple rearrangement, I'm just going to be a bit fast. The entire problem of you know, computing this, this solution to the, this regularized optimal transfer problem is only about this finding two vectors, u and v, such that u is equal to a divided by k, trans k times v, and v is equal to b divided by k transpose u. And here by division, I mean element-wise division. Okay? So you just, what kind of algorithm can you solve, can you use to solve this? You just use what people call a fixed point algorithm. You just iteratively Enforce the first condition, and then enforce the second, and then the first and the second, and the first and the second, etc., etc., et until this converges. And if the problem is well posed, it will converge. And this, will, this is what Sinkhorn proved in the 60s. So Sinkhorn showed that if you want to have the solution to this kind of problem, this algorithm works. And then ever since, there's been a lot of work on this algorithm. And what's interesting is that there's been a lot of recent work driven by the machine learning community. Uh, on this particular algorithm. So yeah, there's a few, uh, if you're interested in, it's a, it's a very nice subfield now that studies basically the convergence of this synchronous algorithm. So to summarize, what I was telling you before is that this problem, the optimal transfer with, before, be, be, without the regularization, you need a network flow simplex, 1,000 lines of codes at least to solve it. Now, with this regularization, by just adding this minus gamma entropy, you get this two lines algorithm. And this is very trivial to implement, and this is what we will implement this afternoon with, with François Pierre. So I think this, I need to stop probably. Yes, I, I just want to look at François Pierre to see if it's okay. Okay. So uh, as there maybe one, or, well, if you have questions, you can also come to me directly. So I think we all deserve a lunch. So see you later or see you tomorrow morning. Thank you.